Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Matt Sadowski. Matt is a robotics contract engineer and the editor of Weekly Robotics. Matt, welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me, Spencer. Thanks Glad for coming in. Appreciate it. All the way from Prague. I uh, I really appreciate you, you making it. And I said I appreciate you staying up, but you're like, ah, still on London time. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I am. Um, I also plan to bring some beer, but then I don't have any, but I have water or something else. We'll see. <laughs> Sounds good. I, um, <laughs> I will drink with you if you want to drink. So <laughs> let me know. I've, I've mostly got whiskey here. Okay. I think I think all the beer in the fridge in the studio is expired by like several years. <laughs> it's from like a while ago. Nice. Doing nice. this low carbohydrate diet. So yeah. Um, so what are some of the cooler things you've gotten to work on over the years? Yeah, there's like working as a consultant, there's, there's plenty. Um, I started my journey working on drones quite a bit. So I, I got into them quite early uh, when I was still studying uh, mechatronics. And my first job was in a company that was making autopilots. So there I was able to work on some cool aircraft, some were like conventional uh, fixed wings or multi-rotors, some were super crazy, like coaxial multi-rotors that weighted probably like over 100 kilograms. So it was, it coaxial was pretty- Coaxial multi-rotors? It, yeah, it's, it was like, I don't, even remember the specifics anymore, but you would have one big rotor uh, on the top and one big on the bottom. And then we would try to control this huge thing. And it was, <laughs> yeah, it, it was quite interesting. Do they um, counter rotate like to balance out torque? Is that how that works or are they? Yeah, yeah. So okay. one rotates the one way, uh, second one the other way. And then Perhaps uh, in this setup, there was some swash plate. So it would have mechanism like tilting mechanism in there uh, just to direct the tr- uh, thrust uh, a little bit. Uh, as I said, details are quite a bit fuzzy now. It, it has been 12 years ago or so. Uh, but yeah, nevertheless, it's cool stuff. Um, in the same company, I was working on some interesting interfaces to autopilots. We were building basically a method that would allow you to control drones in any way you like. So you can think of uh, that perhaps you would have a helicopter and helicopters are very difficult to control. Uh, You need quite some training to do that. You control many levers at the same time. Um, And we would abstract this in a way that uh, we would be able to give you a steering wheel and some pedals and you would uh, drive a helicopter like you would drive a car. Oh, that's cool. So it, was, it was pretty intense and also pretty cool, yeah. And that means you guys must have been doing all the heavy lift on the controls side, uh, if that's the case, because there's no way that maps yeah. one-to-one. <laughs> yes. No, 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 no. Yeah. It, it was, yeah, we were making autopilot, so uh, we had some quite a bit of know-how on this. Um, and yeah, then, then I moved to, uh, like this work was in the UK. Then I decided to move to France, uh, following my girlfriend who got a job at CERN, like doing like this phys- physics lab- laboratory where she was actually flying drones. So like the drones are running in the family kind of, <laughs> uh, uh, and there I was wor- working with a company making small distance sensors called Terebi. Um, this, and we are integrating these sensors on different robots, uh, doing quite cool stuff. Uh, like I 
cannot share the details, unfortunately. But it was ranging from drones to industrial robots and some packaging robots. So it was it was a really interesting experience. Can you say like what type of sensing mod modality and what type of distances or? Uh, so it was uh, single point range finders, if that's how we call them. I don't remember, but you would have Ultrasonic uh, very limited... or infrared or something else. Infrared, okay, yeah. Cool. It's, it was infrared, uh, quite limited uh, field of view uh, at that time. Now they have some um, higher field of view sensors, uh, I think. I, I didn't check for, for quite a while. Oh, no worries. <laughs> um, and then uh, we would have arrays of these sensors mounted in some special ways uh, on the drones. Oh, that's cool. Um, one thing, I like I was writing drivers for this, so if you use PX4 autopilot uh, with yeah big soak or Ardu pilot, uh, then maybe there are still drivers there written by me. <laughs> uh, and we were so for example, you would have this uh, array of sensors all around the drone, and there was pretty neat obstacle avoidance. Uh, I think it was in Ardu pilot. Uh, so you have a drone flying. We did this indoors quite a bit, and it would not crash into the walls thanks to the um, sensors. So you could try. Like a, you could you could try to smash it into the wall, and you yeah, have like a virtual break, bubble. Actually. Yeah, 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 that's really cool. It, it's like a, uh, working with force field. <laughs> that yeah. that was pretty cool. <laughs> um, yeah, and then in my journey, so this was around. 2018, uh, I decided that I would like to try something new. And uh, I decided to become a consultant. I didn't have any projects aligned. I knew that there was something called Upwork. Uh, maybe I did a project or two on Upwork. Actually, I did one. And it was converting some C sharp code to Python. And I think I was paid $10 for a week's a week worth of work. It was quite interesting, uh, but it was a good start. Um, it's, and uh, after I gave my notice, I managed to find my first project. I think two weeks ago, after I gave my notice, uh, the first project came in. And I stayed with that company for uh, two years or a, a bit more. Nice. So it was, uh, yeah, it was, yeah, lots of luck. Uh, and the project was actually one of the most interesting ones I, I worked on. Uh, the company is called Ross Robotics. That's Ross double S uh, at the end. Interesting. And they are a UK ba based company that produces uh, mobile robots. And at the time, they were experimenting with a setup uh, that was uh, reconfigurable. Re sorry, reconfigurable uh, mobile robot. So you have a special kind of connector and all the modules on the robot would use this connector. So it would have an extra computing module or extra LiDAR module uh, and also wheels, uh, like wheel motor combination was also a module. So with this connector, it, it was really plug and play. Uh, it would take you about 10 seconds to replace a module and this comes very useful if you are working in places like CERN, for example, or uh, anything involving nuclear industry, because your hardware will break quite a bit. Yeah. And being able to replace it quickly, it's uh, it was a really neat idea. That's an interesting use case for that, because usually when I think of those sort of uh, reconfigurable chassis, because I think there's a bunch of companies that do that, I think of like research applications or quick prototyping, but... I mean, Nuke makes sense. Like, I, I think that's that's a great application for that, and I would not have thought of that. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. For uh, this, yeah, um, I was actually visiting CERN back uh, when I lived next to it, uh, um, and I was to talking to the robotics, uh, like people working on robotics there, and I think they were testing conventional sensors quite a lot. And the problem with nuclear industry is the the 
more things you have on the chip, the the more probability something will go off uh, because of the radiation. So it's it's a really interesting problem, and they were doing I think lots of tests with the off the shelf hardware, and they knew that okay that this sensor will last uh, maybe two months or <laughs> uh, maybe even a couple of days uh, because that's the environment that they have. So money must just grow on trees over there because they're like, <laughs> we'll just put on a new um, like Veladyne sixty four yeah. line scanner. I think, I think they were using uh, some cheaper sensors because uh, yeah, it's you you throw them away quite a bit. Uh, but yeah, it, it was quite interesting. Um, and I actually like one anecdote I'm saying from like this visit. Uh, they were trying to use the drones in the tunnels uh, at CERN. Uh, do you have an idea why they wouldn't be successful or they decided that this is not not very good idea so to do that? You're talking about multi-rotor drones and you're talking about tunnels like in a nuclear facility. Um, are these... Yeah, in, in CERN you have this uh, big... Uh, like uh how is it called you have the huge tunnel uh and there is a uh, special equipment where the uh you have the beam running uh to create this uh oh i got it so this is like a particle yeah, yeah. collider and yeah yeah, yeah. Exactly. so i don't know what kind of radiation they're working with but just intuitively not being a nuclear person i would think maybe there's radioactive material you could kick up with the the wind from the drones uh, the other yeah, thing exactly. is, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> nice. I, I was asking this the other way, and because the, it never occurred to me that this could be an issue. I, I was expecting, okay, maybe they have huge magnets, uh, they, and then, then maybe the IMUs are not working, but indeed the, the dust is problem because it's a ra radioactive. And when they fly the drones over, the dust goes into the air, and it's more... Uh, not risky because everyone like going into the tunnel have a dosimeter so they know like how much radiation they get and that there are some limits uh, each person can get per year uh, but you know it, it causes unnecessary radiation uh, to be there so yeah. yeah it's interesting stuff for sure no I find nuclear fascinating um, and Again, I don't want, I mean, I mean, maybe I will expose how stupid I am. I, I've not really done a whole lot of work directly in nuclear, if any, but I've worked like nuclear adjacent. So I've worked with a bunch of people that mm -hmm. have worked in nuclear and, you know, we've bid a few proposals to nuclear companies and um, it's, it just seems like a really interesting set of constraints. I mean, I've, I've kind of studied it enough to, to know like the dust is super dangerous like anything that comes into contact with radiation becomes like you know dangerous and then mm -hmm. um like you said you can sort of measure exposure with a dosimeter but i mean you know you still want to minimize that if you can and then it just tries to kill anything electronic like you said so like you know the more complex the chip that's that's a great way to put it you know like a gpu probably isn't going to last very long in that environment and so it's just an interesting set of constraints to try to design for. Not to mention, it seems like certain polymers like will like kind of eat away, and so like mm -hmm. even that'll degrade, which is pretty crazy. So when you think of like rubber or plastic or like that just melting to the point of cracking eventually, or I don't know, there's a bunch of weird design constraints and you know things to think about in that environment. It just seems like a lot of fun, to be honest, from someone who likes puzzles. So I'm kind, yeah, of, yeah. kind of jealous you're getting to work on it. <laughs> so. Well, I, I didn't work on this directly, but uh, I, I think I was also quite adj adjacent uh, to this. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, it's it's such a it's such a neat field. I mean, you know, it's two things I really want to work on that I haven't gotten yet to work on yet are space and nuclear. And I mean, mm -hmm. both of them have that radiation enemy in common, which is kind of interesting yeah. from just a shielding and electronic selection perspective. Um, one of the electrical engineers I worked with got around that by just designing in stupid, simple electronics into his nuclear circuits. So like mm -hmm. through hole component resistors and capacitors and just really basic yeah. logic, you know, and 
just going all analog and that was kind of interesting to me as sort of a workaround um i don't know is it are like vacuum tubes meant to do better in that sort of environment than transistors i think do like it's it's kind of a weird steampunk you know like design constraint yeah yeah, yeah. i think we saw some projects uh there were some projects at icra and uh yeah, they, they try to go analog as much as possible. And then if you have some electronics and you can keep them outside of the contaminated room, that's perfect. So that's... Oh, that's interesting. Uh, so you can do processing off board and then have an umbilical or like a radio. Yeah, yeah. Probably the radio doesn't work as well, depending on how contaminated the room is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have no idea, to be honest. But uh, yeah, I mean, if you can do something off board, you should try it in this industry, I believe. That's really interesting. Yeah. I wonder, uh, this is just me being stupid, but I wonder like what kinds of wireless communication you can use in that industry, if any, because I feel like that's probably jamming signals too. Yeah, yeah, uh, I think so. I have no idea, yeah, to be honest. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, I'm yeah, just I've never looked into that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There was uh, a spent fuel pool um, inspection project that we were trying to bid a few years back. And we shopped it around to a bunch of nuclear companies. And um, that one was interesting because, like, just the cost of and the design constraints on, like, radiation-hardened cameras were really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Like, tens of thousands of dollars for a camera. Um, and, like, all the surfaces are, like, stainless, you know, like, mm -hmm. mirror finish so that you don't have, like, radioactive particles embedding and, like, roughness on the surface. It was kind of interesting. And so... Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I, I feel, I, again, I feel weird talking about Nuke because I'm not like an expert in it, but it's so fascinating. And I feel like we've acknowledged that enough. We can kind of just BS about it and it's still an interesting conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, like you cannot know all the industries inside out. Yeah, but you can try. <laughs> yeah. for sure. Well, that's the beauty of robotics, I think, too, is you get to play yeah. in so many different industries and you know, they're bringing you in because they don't know about robotics. Like they know about their industry, but you know, they want someone mm -hmm. who's the best at robotics to come in and, you know, mm -hmm. give them some insights there. Yeah. So yeah. It, you're kind of um, cooperating, you know, like they'll teach you the background of that. And then hopefully your client leaves knowing a little bit more about robotics as well. And, you know, everybody's mm -hmm. a little bit smarter at the end of the conversation and relationship and, you know, you've done a good job. So. Yeah. And yeah, that's the best. I also found that um, quite often when you talk to the clients, the best solution to their problem is actually not robotics. <laughs> <laughs> the, Depends um, on the client, but that's sometimes true in my experience yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then when I yeah get these kinds of projects, I'm usually saying like, yeah, I, I can do it for you, but you know, if you have a fixed camera looking in this direction, it will do the same job, and then uh, it's probably best you do it that way. Uh, I got approached um, uh, maybe like you know six months to a year ago. I don't remember the exact timeline, but it was to automate a task um, that was. Um, I guess there was like some restriction on people that could be near it, but it was confusing as to what the restriction was. So. My thing mm -hmm. is, like, why not just do it in a back room with a person? Like, you'd save so much money <laughs> for building a robotic system. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, at the time, like, prospective client I was talking to kind of rolled his eyes, and he's like, it's good to hear that, you know, the roboticist in the room isn't just advocating for robotics, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I got the feeling like they'd considered that and ruled it out for some reason, but they kind of didn't give me enough information on the problem to realize that. So, you know, I'm like, well, you know, robotics is really expensive and complicated. Like, are you sure that's what you want to do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know. That's cool. I, I think I, you can also overcomplicate projects really e easily. And I think like, if you can think outside of the box a little bit, if you, that that's quite useful in in our industry yeah for sure uh, there was an anecdote from my school i think so there were some graduates and they were working with some production company and 
they had to change a bit of a production line and they had some items that would arrive uh, horizontally and then they would need to be made uh, vertical. So yeah, you know, yeah. from this to that. And they decided they they just started a company and they decided they, they would use a robot arm because robot arms are the best and you have all the freedom of movement and they would need a week to implement it on site and then they didn't manage uh, in the time like they, they were fresh graduates and i think they yeah they over complicated quite a bit and then i heard that the company that actually implemented the actual solution it was some simple mechanism that would be like a kind of a wheel that would uh, have some slots so the item, item would arrive the and then uh, like making this kind of movement uh, is now in the correct place and yeah. it goes further. So, and I think actually about this issue quite a lot because there is, like, we can do all these things, but uh, essentially we have like one problem to solve if we are lucky, if we're not, then we have many problems to solve. And I think like using the simple approach is usually the best at least in the beginning and then you can iterate so that that's what i've been trying to do yeah yeah i agree it is fun when you end up on a project where like you have to go complicated for some reason because those yeah. are the i mean this is kind of engineering hubris but like it's it's maybe a little bit selfish but like i just find those interesting to build <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah at the same time um I agree with you. I mean, I, I think to introduce unnecessary complexity into a project is, you know, you're, I mean, you're adding expense, you're adding maintenance overhead, you're adding failure points. I mean, you're adding risk to the timeline. You know, there's, it's really not a positive thing unless you have to do it for some reason. Um, what do you think of the new, uh, the new zipline drone that they're they're coming out with? I don't know. I'm assuming you've looked at that. The uh, the droid one, so the, the one, one with the droid. Down. Yeah, just speaking of complex yeah, yeah. systems. Yeah, I actually thought that this is the first drone delivery platform that actually makes sense. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's, uh, I think Zipline. Like I've been follow following Ziplines for quite some years now, and. I really like their approach to engineering, but I think, yeah, at they, their scale, they, they can do quite a but bit. But like, of think of how complicated of a concept of operations that is. I mean, I, I think it's correct, and I think yeah. they're going about it the right way, and there's a good reason for every decision they've made. But you've got mm -hmm. a big drone with like four fixed blades, a fixed wing, and then yeah. a pivoting blade with an actuator that could fail. Um, and then you've got like another mechanism to raise and lower the smaller drone, which I'm assuming mm. has rudders and that, and that one fan for controls. Um, yeah. but like, it makes sense, like acoustic quietness, like the accuracy, being able to combat like wind with, you yeah. know, that little guy, like there's, there's a good, and then you've got a parachute, I think, in like the big drone as well. Like, I think they mm -hmm. talked about that in the Mark Rober video. So, yeah. I mean, that's, you know, it's, it's. It's just pretty wildly complex, but mm. like there's good reasons for all of it. So I, I don't know. That's kind of a neat system like that. I, I'm yeah. that's one where like as an engineer, I'm just like, you know, really starry eyed and, and happy <laughs> and, and I kind of love it. I'm, I'm a huge fan. But like there's yeah. there's a good reason for every complex thing they're doing. And so I don't mm. know, like even like to the yeah. point where like they came up with their own propeller design just to like make it quieter, I guess like that. That to me is mm. pretty neat, you know. So, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, the thing I never liked about drones is the is the noise. Yeah, same. Uh, and I I cannot imagine uh, a world where you have <laughs> steady very drones just uh, buzzing all the way like all day. Uh, and then there were this visualization of the drones like. A landing in your uh, garden and so on uh, with the propellers just spinning, you know, cutting down all your tall plants. 
<laughs> yeah, or or your dog, yeah. or kids. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so that's not very responsible. Even if you have the the propeller guards, uh, like you're landing some heavy equipment uh, in someone's garden, it's it's not ideal. Yeah. Um, and then like parachuting packages uh, could be nice until someone has a swimming pool and there's some wind and so on. So, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it also not necessarily works. Yep. Um, what about uh, ground drones though? Like why, why do you think that isn't a viable approach? Like, you know, four and six wheeled, you yeah. know, just ground delivery vehicles. I, I have to say, I love the idea. Like I would, love to them to be serving like bringing me gross groceries and whatnot but uh i also like walking in the cities uh yeah. i don't know if it's a thing in the u.s uh <laughs> we try to i, I mean <laughs> i think certain like... <laughs> cities are better than others like new yeah, york yeah. is a really walkable city like yeah. I, I i never ride a car anywhere in new york but here in pittsburgh where i live i mean i drive everywhere <laughs> so yeah Prague's a great uh, city I like it there it's, it's a good, good mm -hmm. walking city yeah um, yeah about about these delivery drones like the sidewalk ones um, I don't like the idea too much uh, about sharing the space with them because someone has to so it will be yeah. either pedestrians and sometimes in the cities you have narrow uh forgot how the yeah pavements uh, whatever sidewalk yeah, like, yeah. You know, sidewalk yeah so, uh, narrow sidewalks or it has to be some bike paths and then now those people are pissed off around <laughs> too much yeah <laughs> um, or the cars which is like these things will be slow and then overtaking them can be also quite a bit of dangerous um yeah i would love to see them embedded in the cities but ideally with a separate infrastructure if we can yeah that makes I think sense that would work yeah i don't know if we've seen it as much but like what do you think of the idea of just having like vans with ramps on them that could go and like drop off you know three or four mm -hmm. of those drones and they could just drive up and deliver a package and then the van comes back around and picks them up and then hits like the next four addresses mm -hmm. Like, I feel like that could work. I mean, logistically, yeah. it might be a little bit challenging, like, as a concept of operations. Yeah. I don't know if anyone's tried that yet or is doing that, but. Yeah, I think there were some ads from Ford, maybe, that they were wanted to do something like that. Maybe with drones, actually. I don't know. Like, drones mounted on the track, and then you speed up the delivery. Yeah, but, but then that has yeah, the same I, problem if they're using conventional drones of like props, you know, like yeah. destroying property and risking yeah, pets yeah. and children. And, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think with these delivery drones, like, well, let's, I don't know how to, uh, curbside delivery, like, curbside. Side. Yeah, uh, yeah, that yeah. makes sense. So, yeah. like, yeah. going into a neighborhood, having these drones go out and do the thing and then. Yeah. come back in i think they could work but um i technically you probably can do it but if i was asked to do this i would be hesitant on uh, the economic part of this uh, because each of these has to be basically an autonomous car kind of even if it drives on the sidewalk, uh, uh, it needs some sensing to be able to see small children. Like small children is the best example in robotics because they are always around and just <laughs> <laughs> they are not quite tall. Um, <laughs> and, and then, yeah, you have parked cars and so on. So you need some sensing and it adds, the cost adds up uh, and then processing as well, of course. Um, and then when you have tricky situations, someone takes control. Uh, and I think this is the case for lots of these deli delivery robots right now. So someone is monitoring them and taking control, uh, if not at all times in the tricky bits. Yeah. Uh, 
So then you have some people monitoring them. I don't know how many uh, drones can one person monitor, but uh, you know you you are hire you have extra people to support this kind of one delivery. Uh, it could be more viable to have someone just walk through the doors and maybe it'll be even faster. Uh, I don't know, <laughs> but yeah, I, I bet someone with an MBA already calculated that and uh, sure. they probably know <laughs> yeah if it can make sense or or not um yeah but I'd... i think so some of these companies they are promising quite a low cost of these uh robots so that they can work i've heard a figure of around 500 dollars per per unit uh to make it viable for uh for delivery oh wow that's very low. So, yeah, it's you cannot buy a good sensor for this kind of money. No, right now I think so. So it can be uh, like economic side of it. I think is is the biggest challenge here. Yeah, yeah. Good luck driving costs down that low. That just seems. Well, I mean, maybe in like the very long run, it's doable. Like, I mean, look at what we've done with cell phones, but. But even those yeah. cost more than five hundred dollars. <laughs> That's the cell phone yeah, yeah. actuators. Like and I'm pretty sure they, I don't know they, if like to make it like what an iPhone cost, but I mean retail they're like fifteen hundred. So yeah, I'm sure to make it, it's like at least you know probably two or three or you know like a hundred. Mm. I mean maybe you know. Yeah. So. Yeah. Now that that's pretty wild. I um. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Zipline's tech. I kind of agree with you. I think it's it's sort of the best answer we've seen to the delivery problem. And so it's been kind of interesting to see that uh, that get developed. And it's kind of fun to see them getting like good funding and all this press. And, you know, they're, mm. they're an easy company to like, like especially with like all the blood delivery stuff they've been doing in Africa. You're like, you kind of want them to do well. Yeah, yeah, I'm... Uh, have you heard of their technology for aircraft detection? Um, what do you know about that? I've not. I've not heard so a ton. It was yeah, yeah. Um, I don't remember how it was called anymore. But the like I I covered this in weekly robotics at one point. Uh, but basically, they started adding, or uh, at least on an iron at an R&D stage, they were adding some microphone arrays uh, to, ah. to the drones. And they would filter the noise uh, from the drone and like the air drag mm -hmm. and so on. And they would try to detect uh, nearby aircraft. And they were doing some classification also. And they were really good at uh, being able to say, OK, this aircraft is uh, some Cessna. That's, uh, and because it was an array, I think uh, they would be able to know where they are in uh, in three D space. So it's it was pretty pretty good engineering, and they have super cool a very good write up on this on, on their website. I I, I believe uh, the problem is uh, with this you cannot detect balloons and uh, are there a lot of people doesn't... flying balloons though, like in the Bay Area? Uh, Probably not, but uh, I think it's an additional le level of safety that you can have, um, and I think it's it was I found it pretty good, uh, and the write ups, uh, technical write ups, are also quite good usually. That's really cool. Yeah, those guys are developing so much cool technology. Like that's the microphone array thing just seems like fun. Like I, I really just badass. Yeah, I, I can send you a link uh, afterwards. Yeah, and, sure. Uh, you can, yeah. I, I will definitely out. read that. Yeah, thanks. So what are what are some of the other stories you've covered in uh, Weekly Robotics? Uh, <laughs> Sorry. I would love to say every, everything that happened in the last five years, but it's probably <laughs> not true. <laughs> um, but yeah, every week I try to find something something cool. Uh, trying to Argo. 
I'm just asking. Sorry? I was like, did you cover like Argo going out of business or? Yeah, I think I did. Uh, I guess you kind of had to say something on that. <laughs> um, I don't actually, no, I actually don't remember the details anymore. Yeah, that's fair. That's kind of how I do it with the podcast is I, I just sort of send them out and then forget most of what I did, but then, yeah, you know, like I, you know, it's like I already worked on it. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's done, yeah. yeah. Um, I think I cannot remember most of the stuff because it's every week. Uh, but I do these uh, monthly summaries uh, cool. every month. So then I have a list uh, at the end of the year that like the stuff that I found the most interesting. And then that's uh, I'm trying to do a yearly summary of what I found interesting in a particular year. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I'm trying to remember now, but yeah, you put me on the spot. and oh, I didn't really, mean to do that. I'm yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Um, but yeah, one robot that I, I'm i always looking for some stories on is the Astro B. That's a cool and, one. I, I'm, I'm yeah, definitely yeah. a fan. Did, who got that contract in the end? Because I remember when like NASA was soliciting that, but I haven't been following like who's actually working on it at this yeah. point. I thought it was JPL, but that sounds uh, I don't know probable. Yeah, then, yeah, yeah. But it was uh... there were a bunch of research contract calls on that that I remember like when I was looking at like small okay. business innovation research contracts. I saw a bunch of stuff for yeah. that, and I'm like, this looks like fun to work on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah, and then you would work on space robots. Yeah, so that's, that's super cool. <laughs> um, <the> <laughs> yeah, uh, I really like that this is at least parts of it are open source and it's running gross on oh, some cool. level. Like it has many. Uh, so there's some core software that's running there, if I remember correctly, and then you you have uh, at least ROS interface uh, to it, so you can interface, uh, yeah, with ROS to it, and then they have some Android module, I think, and uh, that's where you do guest science on. So, yeah, it, it's probably if it's running something, it will be Android for for the high level apps. Nice. Uh, Do you know if they're yeah, still the, using ROS 1, ROS 2? This one was ROS 1. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, it seems like everyone's uh, still using ROS 1 pretty much, but like everybody says yeah. they're going to switch to ROS 2 soon. <laughs> yeah, the time is running out. So yeah, we'll do it when everyone else does it. <laughs> so. yeah. yeah, that's a good strategy. Yeah, um, yeah and I think, he, yeah. Um, if you find the Astro B software repo, there are also simulations. So uh, you can run a simulation in Gazebo. Oh, that's pretty so cool. That, that has to be quite cool. Have you actually yeah. built it and run it? No, I, I'm i planning to, but I, yeah. I'm I mean, you've got to find the time. So short on time, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Nobody's paying you. You've got the publication. You've got work. You know, yeah, I, I'm yeah. kind of like that too, where like there's new technologies I really want to explore and play with, but I don't have like a client need or I'm not, you know, there's no business case to learn it like immediately. I mean, the business case in the long run is to increase skill and competence mm -hmm. and know the latest stuff, but it's just hard to find the time. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yeah. Like I agree. Yeah. Um, when do you find time to write uh, for weekly robotics? Like, yeah. Uh, it takes about six hours uh, to complete one issue. Oh, wow. Uh, on average. So yeah, it's it's quite a commitment. Um, I usually, so the way I do it is I have an RSS feed. Uh, I assume you know RSS. Yeah. Yeah, so basically, yeah, some news websites have an XML you can subscribe to, and then you are never missing uh, any news that they publish so i think you can do that feel, for like uh torrent trackers too right for like being able to know like when yeah. certain things come available for download so oh i i didn't try it but 
Yeah. Maybe I should. <laughs> <laughs> I would never torrent anything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I heard. Then you would look for robot leaks and then <laughs> see what's going on in the industry, maybe. Maybe that could work. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you've got RSS feeds coming in. Yeah. And then I try, like, when I have time, you know, someone, sometimes I would wake up and I feel lazy. So then I would just start browsing and see what's interesting. Um, and then I'm bookmarking all the interesting stuff. So at this point, I not always read the articles and so on. But uh, if it sounds, sounds interesting, I will save it for later. And then at some point, I will just sit down, see all the uh, all the new stuff that I bookmarked. And then I'll be like, OK, this goes in, this goes in. And yeah, I will this and then decide that this is not a good fit. And I'll just remove it. and. Um, yeah, and I will create a, an issue and then send it out every Monday. That's cool. Yeah, I'd be curious to know what some of the feeds are that you're monitoring, but I don't want to force you to say that because I'm sure people listening are just going to try to. Like, no, I, I don't mind uh, <laughs> because if they make a newsletter, then I can read their newsletter and then I will definitely find some interesting stuff that I missed. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, yeah, I think it's it's not a zero sum game. Um, I think the most interesting ones with quality articles would be IEEE Spectrum. Nice. Uh, the robot report, uh, like, like these are in, like in the business side. Yeah. Uh, Hackaday is super cool for DIY projects. Hackaday and is neat. I like them a lot. Yeah, they, they, they are amazing. I love them. Uh. Um, and then. I think these are the largest one that just we should we should have... tag Steve and Mike on the uh, on the podcast description for added reach since you mentioned the robot report. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not? Um, what else is there? Um, one good source uh, for me is uh, Archive. So I subscribe to the robotics papers on Archive. What, like archive.org or, or a different one? Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. One. I did not know they had a robotics uh, publication. Yeah, yeah, they have. Uh, no, you. sorry. Uh, no, it's, wait, let's see. Because it's, yeah, it's not like web archive. It's the oh, okay. That's ARXIV, you know, the, the one with the papers. Oh, I got I it. I think yeah. they, they spell it archive, but it, yeah, it's like archive. Archive, archive. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not <laughs> sure how to spell. <laughs> but that's. Uh... But anyway, yeah. I I subscribe to the robotics after, and then I I try to go through at least the titles of papers, and then maybe read the abstracts, and then decide if it's a good good fit. That's like um, how I read patents, basically. <laughs> okay. Yeah, just look at I the pictures, that's... read the claims, and then I've read the patents. Yeah. <laughs> I heard that you should never admit of uh, to read patents. <laughs> what, what's that, that, that? What's the harm in saying you read patents? No, no. I, I think uh, no. It's there's no harm in just if you are saying like general. But if you said, okay, I read your patent, and then you did any similar work, they can and they can prove that you read their patent. Then it's apparently easier for them to go after you because yeah you you admitted to reading my patent so you kind of knew what you were doing <laughs> <laughs> that makes no, sense I, intuitively I, for... I i i figured if you have a patent it's like you still have blanket protection even if someone doesn't know about your patent you can still yeah, claim yeah, infringement but, but yeah but then if if they can prove that you do it did it knowingly i think it's uh, much worse for you yeah i don't know perhaps I recently read like a whole bunch of patents uh, from a company that we're trying to get as a customer just because I wanted to understand their technology and, and really mm -hmm. have a good idea of what they were up to before I walked into the meeting. And it was yeah. a really good way to kind of, you know, just watching it's the videos on their website, reading all their patents and like, you know, just looking at videos on YouTube. I feel like I kind of understood how the technology worked before I walked into their facility. And then I was able to ask more pointed questions. So, I don't know. 
That's a very nice life hack, actually. Oh, thank you. I never thought of doing that. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's great. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, you know, as I get older, I feel like I'm I'm trying. I'm getting lazier, so I'm just like. Maybe this will save me a second visit. <laughs> so. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And then if you point out, oh, you know, your patent or some on something, then yeah. Yeah, I they feel good that you read it. Yeah. Fix it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I was talking to uh, a U.S. Army uh, major general the other day for work because I've been trying to get into like government work. And I found a typo on his LinkedIn. And I'm like, I found a typo on your LinkedIn. And he's like, ah, no one's ever pointed that out to me before. Thanks. <laughs> so, <laughs> nice. Yeah, I just felt, felt kind of proud of myself. I'm like, I found a thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, That's yeah. what we do in robotics, right? You need to be like, look at the little things. For sure. Bit. My my dad's cousin is the guy that got me into robotics. This guy, Lee Weiss, that went to the Robotics Institute in the 70s at Carnegie Mellon. And he's the one that like made me think about robotics from a young age and want to get into it. Um, and he said something to me once that I, I still remember to this day, which is like, if you're going to find a flaw in someone else's work, like that's a great way to impress them and dare them to you. But you better double and triple check to make sure you're right before you accuse someone of that. Because <laughs> if you get it wrong, you're going to look like an asshole. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I've been there. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I have too. But usually, like, if I'm wrong on something like that, like, if I just kind of am spitballing, like, I'll backpedal right away. I'll be like, oh, I'm actually, I apologize. I, I misfired there. Mm. So I feel like that's that's not bad. Like, if you're not afraid to say, you know, like, kind of, be quick, but then you're quick to admit if you're if you fucked up, then you know I think you're you're an adult. You know? Yeah, yeah, I, I think like I don't have any issues with just yeah uh, saying when I was wrong, and I think clients appreciate it actually. Yeah, and if they don't, then you shouldn't work with them anyway. So that's. <laughs> It's like a win-win, probably. Yeah, I, I, I there was something funny I heard today at work. Um, I, I was having lunch, and the colleague I was sitting down with was like, um, "You know, I'm not, I'm not really religious, but the, you know, this quote kind of is." But I thought it was still funny, so I'm going to repeat it anyway. But it was, um, you know, um, something he says to like kind of hostile clients. It was. Um, there's no perfect engineers. Um, you know, I'm not a perfect engineer, and there are no perfect engineers. I read a book about a perfect carpenter once, and if you believe that there are perfect engineers, then I think you might need him more than me. <laughs> so, <laughs> nice. <laughs> that was kind of funny. Yeah. <laughs> so, kind of a nice way of telling someone to back off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> demanding something that doesn't exist in perfection. Mm. So. Uh. Did you actually get any request, interesting requests for projects that were not doable? Ha! Huh, that's a good question. Yeah. I, I, I want to turn that back on you, but maybe I'll think about it first and try not to dodge the question. Um, yeah. Okay. So we put out, um, we got a laser cutter maybe like f six years ago or so. And we put out an article about it, um, you know, and like a little video of like, yeah, this is what our laser cutter can do. Or here's us cutting some keychains with the SKA logo. And then um, somebody reached out and asked if we could laser cut uh, their makeup bottles for a cosmetics company. And I'm like, that's not really how a laser cutter works. Like, yeah, I could see how they would have thought that, you know, like maybe in their mind, it's like 3D sculpting, you know, and you're like. You know, you can do anything, but, you know, like, no, two-dimensional shapes only, you know, that mm. it's not exactly viable. I'm sorry, you know. And then when I said that, they got, like, really offended and, um, you know, it was, like, not not the best interaction. There's another one where somebody approached me and they wanted to use um, – I'm trying to think. Um, so – what can I say that doesn't like give them away, but it's like, it's not a viable idea, but I still don't want to like, 
repeat stuff that they told me where they felt like they were under confidence. Um, they wanted to use submarines to do something where you didn't make any sense at all to use submarines. And when I tried to get at them from like a first principles perspective and say like, why do you want to do that that way? You know, that seems unnecessarily complex and, and like it doesn't really make sense. They, they got really, really offended and kind of, you know, harumphed me. And, and, you know, it was it was very awkward. Um, and I got the feeling that they might have been trying to like defraud their investors. And, you know, it wasn't wasn't okay. an ethical company. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that that's, you know, that could be anyone. <laughs> There's plenty of submarine companies out mm-hmm. there. So. You know, yeah, yeah. your guess is as good as infinity. Um, what about you? So I actually don't have like, any stories on things that were physically impossible, but the requir- requirements were off. Um, so for example, uh, I had one request to look into a project about making a mobile robot that would uh, that could be carried into the room and then it would uh, do some tasks let's say um painting the walls so someone could carry it in and then it would paint all the wall, wall all the way up and it's really important that this robot uh, can be carried by one human because there should be one one worker. Did they specify how tall of walls you had to be able to paint? Yeah, like two meter, like like okay. the standard standard yeah, walls. So yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, I think it's part of the like my work as a consultant to uh, sit down with the client and uh, tell them that okay, may like I don't think it's possible based on the limitations we have here. Because if something needs to go really high up, it has to wait quite a bit uh, to be able to uh, like handle all the mechanism and not tip over and so on. I mean, you can sort so, of do it like with like dynamic stabilization and like telescoping linkages and but it's like you're fighting a battle with gravity and money, yeah, like for sure, <laughs> yeah, and then you need a battery life and then you need to carry the paint as well, and it's a it, like in in this case, yeah. it didn't really make sense. Yeah, I agree with you there. Yeah, and but yeah, the the client was uh, super good about it, and they were actually yeah that this was like R and D, like heavy R and D, where you just read stuff and suggest some hardware, and then see if it it can make sense. Yeah. And yeah. I, these kind of projects are quite interesting. Uh, some others that I got was um, a company was looking into making some autonomous uh, ground vehicles uh, for very constrained environments. Huh. Constrained uh, in what way? Uh, in, in like the path would always be the same there would be no people in normal circumstances and and so on but makes it easier they would need yeah yeah way easier uh but they need a very precise localization how precise and it had to be uh i think like five centimeter maybe ten centimeters but it seems quite doable. precise let's say yeah <laughs> yeah uh but uh vision only no lighter huh uh and Weird. Uh, the environment will be constantly changing lights and Fuck uh, me. <laughs> different light patterns <laughs> projected on the walls <laughs> what are you trying to navigate so, a rave like what you... <laughs> yeah, yeah something like that yeah. <laughs> um, that's wild <laughs> yeah that so this this kind of projects why no lidar yeah. at that point like why is it just expensive like and they didn't want to spend the money or were they worried yeah, about it, human it, eyesight or like uh i don't recall to be honest uh could be either yeah it makes sense yeah but uh but yeah every now and then you, you maybe get at that kind of point you request. get like ultra wideband beacons or like i don't know there's other weird stuff yeah. you can do you know, yeah, if it's a controlled it's, environment and it's always the same, or you could just bury a wire like '80s or '90s style, you know, mm-hmm. and go go back to old school wire guided. Yeah, that 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 was my instinct. Wire or the magnetic tape, 
the, yeah. these things are quite good. Uh, but or you could have markers I on the floor if it's allowed, and then just have like a illumination facing yeah. downward with a shroud, so you can't see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, there. Are, that, that's the thing I love about robotics. Like you have, you can uh, have so many ways to solve the problem. It just you need to convince the client that to go <laughs> go with one of these instead of their preferred methods that might not necessarily work. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's how you build trust, though, I think. Like, okay, so here's a question for you. Like, do you prefer a client that sort of looks at you as a technical shepherd and, like, maybe doesn't understand the technology as much themselves, where you get to, like, educate them pretty much from square one? Or do you prefer a client that's, like, an engineer, but they just don't have enough time to do the thing that they're asking you to do, mm -hmm. where they, they pretty much know, like, exactly, and they're going to get down on the nitty gritty yeah. with you. But, you know, it, it's yeah. your work isn't magic anymore. Like, which one's, which one's yeah. better in your, in your experience? <laughs> the first one feels the best. <laughs> <laughs> like you're, you are walking in as a rock star, and then, yeah, and you say, like, you start telling them it's literally about magic <laughs> localization yeah magic we have this hardware we can use this and and then yeah it, it feels good yeah. uh on the other hand uh, the second approach it's really i think you learn a bit more uh in that because there's someone experienced there already in the team and uh, you will always learn something new and if you are just guiding of course, you will learn as well. Uh, I think you, you should always learn. Uh, if if not robotics, you will learn about the industry that you are servicing. So oh, for there's sure. At least that. Um, so yeah, and it can be difficult at times, uh, like with this first approach, in that sometimes it's good to have someone to brainstorm uh, and uh, in. If you don't have any other roboticists in the company, it might be like it's all on you. Yeah, and yeah. <laughs> you need to guide this. You need to start creating the teams. So then maybe at some point you'll be able to do these brainstorms. Yeah. Um, but yeah, either way, either way works. Just uh, I would try to avoid being uh, being a code monkey. Really? So you just yeah. type in the code. Yeah, you just. You do that, make it work this way, uh, no exceptions, and just just code it up and don't ask questions. Well, and that's like, interesting. These kind of projects, yeah, I, I don't really like. Like, yeah, you no can... questions. Don't understand the system. Just trust us. We know <laughs> what we are doing. I mean, you can um, usually push back, though. I feel like with clients like that, like in my experience, like if you tell them, like, look, I'm not comfortable working on this unless I understand what's going on. I mean, they'll, yeah, yeah. they'll back I, I, off sometimes, like, especially if you show that, like, you've got pretty good domain knowledge and can keep a secret. <laughs> you know? just like... yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I actually never had a project like that. Uh, sometimes you have a phase where you feel like a code monkey because stuff needs to be done. And then you're building a yeah, new you... relationship with a technically sophisticated client and they're they think they know yeah. better and they want to put all the guide rails on you. And so, like, they, you know, they might push yeah. you into that situation where you're, you know, a little bit over constrained. And then you're like, Hey, you know, your management overhead on this has got to be through the roof. Like, why not let us take some of that on now that we've shown you yes. we can deliver. And, you know, maybe we meet up like once every other week instead of once every day, you know, and, and like push in that direction. And I found yeah. like, once you, once you start delivering, like with like the higher oversight, like you can kind of, like clients are happy to back off once they know they can trust you, you know? And like, yeah, it's funny. Cause I actually like the second type of client more. Like I, I like the okay. ones that kind of know exactly what they want and know how to do it. Cause in my experience, like they appreciate like good engineering a little bit more than the ones that think it's magic. The ones that think oh, yeah. it's magic are easier to impress like out of the gate, but the ones that like know exactly what they're looking at and are, are kind of hip, like, those ones mm -hmm. are like, I think they're easier to get like as like lifelong repeat clients and they're more forgiving of like the kind of mistakes that happen 
you know, in the engineering mm-hmm. process because, you know, you're not perfect and nobody is. And, you know, you're learning as you go because this is R&D. <laughs> and so, yeah. yeah. I also think that the second type of client uh, understands the costs usually way more. Uh, For sure. So they, yeah. So with, yeah, client number one, you will have quite a bit of overhead on pricing and then explaining why the sensor you want to use costs six at like three thousand dollars yeah why they saw that you can buy a lighter for 300 so why why not get that (laughs) it's like well that lighter you i mean do you really want us to use the lighter from a robotic vacuum (laughs) like is that yeah (laughs) you know that you know if that rubber band snaps the lighter doesn't work anymore like there's a lot of ways that could go wrong yeah 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 it's actually something I also find in some of the robotics company. They want to, to my approach to R&D usually, uh, or at least the preferred approach is to like have really high quality hardware and start with that uh, for the prototypes. Agreed. And then once you know what your requirements are uh, for sure, like how much accuracy you want, you start scaling down the hardware just to fit the application and you have the ground truth for how the system should behave and then you work with that. Uh, yeah, but I agree. I found that, yeah. Uh, and some, But some companies will want to uh, save from the beginning and they will have you work with these sensors that it takes two or three days to set up because there, there are some quirks about them. And then, and then their con ops changes and they don't even need that sensor anymore. And now you've got all those engineering hours into yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. Or, or you try to explain that it would be cheaper to actually buy the higher end sensor uh, because it will work out of the box. And, but they will still want to go with the yeah, cheaper one, Yeah, like very cheap one. And then it will spend days and it will end up costing more, but they are okay with that. And for sure. I completely agree. It's a battle sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I feel like the more technical clients understand that more. And so it's at least easier to sort of, you don't have to explain like basic development methodologies as much. And so the educational overhead is lower, but I don't know. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I've definitely had clients like I, I had a project that um, my team worked on one time where we um, were asked to create um a keypad for something and um you know we um we reached out to 20 companies that make like rubberized keypads and we yeah. found that like you know industry standard lead times on those is four to six weeks and like nobody quoted less than four weeks lead out of 20 companies mm-hmm. and the clients like can we have it in three weeks and you know we're like uh, i mean we could try making the tooling ourselves and pouring the urethane and, and seeing if we could do that and so um we we ended up doing all that and then we got maybe like a weekend or like half a weekend and then they sent us like a design iteration and then we had to change our tooling design and like remachine the tooling and then we got like another you know like you know i don't know five days in and then they sent us another design iteration and then we had to like throw out the tooling and <laughs> machine new tooling again and so i mean they ended up costing themselves like tons of money and it was like I think it ended up taking us six weeks in the end because we had like four different like engineering revisions on the mechanical design for the keypad. Um, yeah. And you know it was like mm. you know we're like hey I think we should freeze the design if your timeline's a concern here. But you know, <laughs> you know that's not always how it goes. Yeah. Do you often have situations where uh, things change? And you have to react in the projects that you do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we've had projects where maybe, you know, the initial design is based off of an assumption about the market that turns out to not be correct. Like the more, you know, the prospective end user starts interacting with the system. And so, you know, the concept of operations changes and that changes the actual low level design. And so, 
-hmm. it can be frustrating to a lot of engineers when that happens, I think, because, you know, if you've been working on a mechanical design or an electrical design or a piece of software and all of a sudden, you know, you're asked to run in a different direction. I mean, you kind of want to murder your manager or the client or like there's, you know, there's a lot of emotions that are high, but I feel like, you know, just thinking about the reasons for it, like you can't really hold anyone in contempt because, you know, when you got the original directive, like you were being asked to like, you know, nothing was in bad faith. Like you were being asked to move in what the client at the time thought was the best direction, given the knowledge they had at that point in history. And then they uncovered more facts and, you know, like the direction changed and, you know, what are they supposed to just see, you know, like a dead end all the way through? Cause they started it that way. Like, no, you know, like go, go the, what you think is the best direction. But I mean, it can be frustrating sometimes, um, like in the heat of the moment, you know, when you're, when you're finding out new facts kind of after you've put in a large amount of work, that's one of the reasons, um, SKA now does all of our work, time and materials instead of trying Mm -hmm. to flat rate contracts. Like we used to try to do everything flat fixed rate. And I mean, there's a few reasons. So one is that like the estimation and like project timeline overhead at the beginning of the project was just through the roof. Like, you know, we'd spend all this time trying to figure out what something would cost to do and like the waterfall, you know, Gantt chart and all that crap. And, you know, we'd like get all that and then it would never go the way you planned. And then when something would go off of your, your scope, you know, you would implement a change order and then that's expensive in terms of the, you know, the negotiation and the yeah. paperwork and, you know, getting the client to sign off. Like, all that's not free. Um, and so even though like, you know, I mean, it, it can end up feeling that way sometimes, you know, which is frustrating. So, I mean, we've found recently it's like a lot more straightforward just to go T&M and then check in regularly and then just follow, yeah. you know, the scope as it, you know, morphs and changes as, you know, you and the client and the end user learn more about the, you know, actual, yeah. you know, operating modality of this thing. So what's been your experience? Actually the same. Um, yeah, I, you know, when you are a consultant freelancer and you start reading online, like everyone says you should, should do fixed price contract yeah, because for sure. there is a premium and, and so on. But I think it doesn't hold for R&D heavy subjects like robotics because you have software, electronics, mechanics, and like any of these goes wrong, uh, your estimations can go like be thrown out. (laughs) And I think in robotics, if you can estimate the project correctly, then you are not doing too much R&D because you must have done it already, right? Yeah. So yeah. (laughs) <laughs> I, I tried uh, doing this fixed price contract, but I yeah. I gave up after I spent two weeks trying to make Jetson Nano work the way I wanted it to work. <laughs> yeah, I, I, the, the, I had to recompile some kernels and, and whatnot to enable some functionality. It was, it was interesting times. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I, I do. I actually do time. Uh, like I get paid by the hour. Yeah, and customers ship hardware to me. Nice. Yeah, we do that Ideally. too. So that's yeah. We'll, we'll, also, we'll also do purchasing, um, but there's an administrative overhead when we do purchasing of materials. Yeah, just because I mean that's not free too. Like some purchasing agent or me or an engineer has to go and buy mm-hmm. the thing, but you can't really bill engineering rates for that. So we just apply a fixed yeah. administrative markup. And, I don't know. That nice. seems to work for us, but we'll we'll also just take customer materials. Like, hey, if you don't like our admin mm-hmm. market, just ship us a bunch of them and do it yourself. You know, <laughs> like that's fine yeah, too. yeah, that's nice. But you know, the, um, what I've found is when you're in active execution, if you need, you know, everything to be shipped, it's just another thing that slows down the project because now you're waiting for like the client to get around to shipping it, and they're busy as hell because they hired you in the first place, and so. Like Mm -hmm. if they trust you enough to give you the leeway to run purchasing, it can speed things up. I found so that's that's why I kind of like having that leeway. Yeah, yeah. it sounds really good. Yeah. Uh, Going back to the no robotics being constant change. um, Have you had many projects where you would have really waterfall 
kind of planning and it actually worked. Because I feel, <laughs> at least for me, it's always, you know, change, 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 and it's fine. Or, or sometimes you I get like lucky and, and you knock it out ahead of schedule because you figure yeah. something out that you didn't think you were going to be able to do on the onset. That sometimes happens. Yeah. Um, I, I kind of agree with you with like when you're researching this or when you're talking to people, everybody seems to think like you can make crazy money, you know, if you flat rate. And that, to be honest, that probably works like not in R&D, but if you're like doing small deviations on the same project and just selling the same thing over and yeah. over and over again with slight modifications, in which case, like you're not totally in the wrong doing that because, you know, part of the package that the customer is paying for is your pre-existing IP. So that makes sense. Yeah. But I mean, I'm sure it sounds like you and, and me and my company work on like similar types of problem sets, which is like just stuff that's deeply, you know, like in the unknown and like hasn't been done before. In which case, like you said, you know, if you've never done it before, how the hell are you supposed to estimate it accurately? On the waterfall yeah. stuff, it's it's been interesting. I've I've had it either go like way under budget or way over budget. Like I, I've not had a whole lot of those that went like exactly as expected on R and D projects. Okay. So what about you? Yeah. Yeah. Same. Uh, yeah, but I'm really not. Yeah, I don't think I ever had a waterfall project structure in place in robotics. Like everyone wants to do agile these days. Yeah. And, a lot of companies uh, seem to want to do agile, but then they don't know what it means when you talk to them about it. Yeah. So they're like, okay, yeah, so what's I've, the stage gate for this part of the agile process? And you're like, those are mutually yeah. exclusive, bro. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think like waterfall sounds like a best, uh, solution in robotics because, uh, you will have this like electronics, mechanics and software. Yeah. Uh, but the, I feel like we need something in between because yeah. things are changing, right? And you will, if at least in R and D space, you will never get it right the first time around. So you need to like we start uh, circling back uh, yeah. quite a bit. Well, and I think there is a misconception, like you know, and that like there's companies that will say they do it the first time, but companies like that, I think, are doing a lot of testing that their customer doesn't know about. And the first time mm -hmm. is just the first customer facing demo. But, you know, that design was validated in an R and D lab and there's tons of mistakes the customer didn't see. And so that's yep. that's kind of what it really is, you know. I'm sorry, Santa Claus probably isn't real mm -hmm. either. But yeah. It's mm -hmm. like... <laughs> yeah. But I hope that yeah, as you do more and more projects, you are more experienced and you can just uh yeah, like getting closer and closer to waterfall hopefully yeah but yeah I, i'm yet to see that <laughs> well I, I mean it's kind of what you said which is like you know are you really doing work that's ambitious and and deviant from the work you've done in the past yeah. you know or you know are you just doing something that you've really done and sold the same thing like you know 50 times over because in that case you probably can waterfall it you know if, if yeah, it's yeah. the 50th time you're doing it i'm sure you know you yeah. know down to the you know down to the week like what the project execution will take yeah. <laughs> so yeah the, if someone asks me to implement like robot localization and slam on a mobile robot with ross then yeah that would be probably a case <laughs> uh but yeah but i don't have time for this now because so. <laughs> <laughs> i'm focused more on this r d project so that's uh yeah yeah, it makes sense. That's cool. Yeah, I've done. Um, I've not done as much with Ross, to be honest. Um, it seems it seems like a good way to do things. Uh, my teams have used Ross in the past, like for like uh, Arviz and Gazebo, like to like visualize robots that didn't mm -hmm. exist yet that we were building software for. But we've not used it as much on our critical path, and so. I guess that was critical path because you can't test unless you have a visualization and a simulation, but you know what I mean? Like not, not as much like, yeah. for like output. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I don't know, like, what do you, what do you like about Ross? What do you not like about Ross? Like, what would you change about Ross? If you could, if you could do it all over yeah. again, what do you think other people should be doing that Ross does? Mm -hmm. 
Aside from just using um, Ross, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think just use Ross. Um, <laughs> uh, I think it it really depends on what you are doing. And, you know, in some cases, uh, you really need some real-time control or some safety hardware that is, like, very close to, to your solution. And in that case, you might be looking into embedded stuff and so on. And in these cases, like, uh, I would probably try still like a hybrid approach. So have a bit of uh, ROS for some high level stuff and then low level control if, if that's allowed in the project. Uh, of course, yeah, everything depends. Um, but what I like the most about ROS is all the tooling. Um, yeah. I'm, if someone is following good practices, uh, so you have uh, every pack, like separate packaging, and then you use config files, launch files in the directories that are correctly named. Uh, you go into this kind of project, and you know exactly the project st uh, structure uh, the moment you open the project directory. And then you will see, okay, this is the bring up. So here is where the stuff where I will be launching the like whole simulation or or the robot and then you will see that okay this is called, this one is called navigation and so on so so it it kind of forces you of course following best practices to have this kind of model <laughs> and once you have this model in your head that this is quite a bit of distributed system i think it it, it helps quite a bit um and then I, I was talking about tooling but then i just yeah went quite far away from it. That's all right. Uh, talking about like structuring yeah. of projects and just quick handoff, which is <laughs> yeah, a valid, yeah. yeah, valid point. If you're all talking <laughs> the same language, it's easier. Yeah, exactly. And then you have the visualization with R tools like RVs, uh, plotting uh, libraries and so on. And for me, this is a huge value uh, because you can see how things are or were in the past on the robot. And especially the back files are super useful. Uh, and that's because I mostly work remotely uh, with clients. So if something goes wrong on their platform or I need to see what happened, um, I just replay the back file and then I have all the data uh, and I can see what was going on. And I had projects where I never had hardware in my hands. The customer was doing like all, all of this because that's what they are good at. And then I would be supervising them remotely and then building software just based on the back files. That's cool. So it's, um, it's not easy and you cannot do the whole stack this way uh, from back files. But I call it kind of like a passive part of the system and uh in in you this mean case the login. i would name uh yeah no so i mean uh passive part would be perception okay uh like slam but not navigation because in navigation your system reacts to to the input and since your data is pre-recorded there's nothing you can do to tell it to go the other way because like it, it's a yeah, you are replaying the data. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, so for these passive parts of the system, it's actually very good because I'm sick of setting up robots in the field. Like <laughs> it takes so much time. Every time it's just half a day of just fiddling with hardware. So I just want to do it once, uh, like make sure that my data is flowing okay. And then I would just record the back file and then spend uh, couple of hours tuning the parameters to get it to a point where I like the out like what I'm seeing. And then I would retest with the tuned parameters uh, in real life. And then uh, this way you can move way faster. That's pretty cool. And that's the, that's the thing I yeah appreciate the most about Ross, I think. Uh, yeah. I will say, like, it is really cool how good the tool, tools are getting to where you don't actually have to have everyone in a room anymore to work on a robot. Like, that is 
that has been a huge advance, you know, partially due to Ross, mm -hmm. partially due to SolidWorks, partially due to Altium, you know, yeah. I don't know. There's there's a lot of just great tools out there that, that make it more practical than it's ever been to be able to, you know, have remote operators. I mean, there's, there's another thing uh, that we've done on robots in the past where we'll make a less expensive miniature version of a robot. So, like, maybe you mm -hmm. get, like, an off-the-shelf, like, drivetrain out of, like, a toy that's similar to your drivetrain, and then you replicate all the uh, control electronics and compute and you hook it up to that through like a similar drive that it would use for the full scale robot. And it's yeah. like, you can send that in a Pelican case to like a autonomy engineer and, and have them mess around with that, you know, for like a fraction of the price that it would cost to like fly them out, you know, over and over to work on the actual robot. You know, if you've got like a remote autonomy engineer, which is kind of neat. Yeah, um, the bag files are helpful too. Nice. I, I kind of agree with that. Um, I mentioned a project where we used, um, you know, Ross as a visualization tool and on that project, like the bag files were still helpful in that context. And so it was kind of neat because mm -hmm. you could replay scenarios and I don't know, it was, it was incredibly useful. Cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I had some, one more point about Ross, but I actually forgot. Well, maybe it will come back. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, it's not coming, but <laughs> that's all good. Yeah. So, what are uh, what are areas that like you kind of want to work on that you haven't gotten to work on yet? I mentioned space and nuclear being kind of mine. Yeah, space would be really cool, um, but probably hard to get uh, for you know an external consultant. Like, I I don't imagine NASA would look into hiring contractors for I think some they do. stuff. I think they, they I think do, they I do think. pretty yeah. frequently. Like, well, I mean, I don't know. They hire large contract entities. Like, I think I could be wrong on this. And if I am, send all hate mail to podcast.sk.solutions. But <laughs> I think uh, I think Northrop Grumman, like, worked on, like, the lunar lander in the 60s, right? And there were, like, tons of mm -hmm. subcontractors that worked on the space shuttle. Uh, SpaceX right. is a subcontractor to NASA. Um, I don't know. There's yeah. a bunch of them, you know? <laughs> so like, I, okay. I think it's Go more on. common than you think. Like, I don't know. I, I'm pretty like on that, on that, um, what the hell was the name of that, uh, robot that like floats around that you were talking about? Um, Astrobee. Astrobee, right. On, on yeah, Astrobee. Yeah. I mean, the reason I knew about that project was because I read, you know, like calls for private contractors to come in and work on it, you know, like, We'll give you okay. X amount of money if you come in and figure out this thing for Astro B. And, you know, that gets blasted out on, like, U.S. government, you know, mm -hmm. websites. So, I don't know. I think it's more common than you realize there. I could I be wrong. I probably need to move to, to the U.S. then. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Get started on some space stuff, yeah. But, I mean, there's, like, the European Space Agency, right? Like, I mean, I, I know yeah, people yeah. that have done private contracting for them that, like... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I should check them out or become an astronaut, which would be double cool. Yeah, for sure. I imagine being in space with your robots and testing them. That's like that'd be pretty. I think cool. I, I think I'm too old to be an astronaut now. Like I'm pretty sure they don't want like <laughs> overweight, you know, thirty something year old <laughs> <laughs> bald guys like on the space station because it would it would lower the standards for the program. <laughs> <laughs> Fine, we'll build our own space station. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm. I never did. Also, I never looked into submarine robotics, but I'm not sure I would be too keen working on that. That I seems like fun to me hard. too. I, I, yeah, I mean it's hard enough to make something that passes an ingress protection test on the yeah. surface, you know, let alone <laughs> <It's true. laughs> under, you know, a hundred meters of water or whatever, <laughs> the kind yeah. of pressures you get. Like it's, I don't know offhand the rules of thumbs, but it's like crazy. The amount of force that's like pushing on your seals. Mm. Um, yeah. Like I don't, I don't know exactly how they're combating that, but I, I it's, 
I feel like it's like deceptively, like it looks way easier than it is. Like when you see like, you know, like the hunt for red October or like, you know, like, you know, just all the submarine, like we've had submarines since like what, like the 1930s or twenties or something like that. But like, they're so challenging. Like they're so difficult to make that work. And like, I mean, Ingress is trying to get you from every single angle. And like, I mean, yeah. I don't know. There's a reason like we haven't been able to get all the way to the bottom of the ocean. Like for instance, mm -hmm. you know, and like, at least not that I know of, like, I don't know, maybe we figure that out by now, but I feel like it, we haven't, um, I could be wrong, <laughs> but yeah. yeah. Well, I, I don't know as well, but it, it must be tricky. And then yeah. I've heard about some companies that are pretty good in the doing localization, uh, underwater. Interesting. But to me, this, this sounds very challenging stupid difficult uh, yeah especially if you have lots of depth because you need to go down until you can see something that you can track yeah to I, i'm told uh, that one way you do it is just with like a really expensive imu so like I, yeah. I, somebody I, I don't know if these numbers are still current but like maybe like a decade ago like I, don't know, I think I would have been in grad school. Somebody was telling me about like six hundred thousand dollar like IMUs that they use in like you know U.S. Navy okay. nuclear submarines, and like you know I'm like I don't know how much IMU you get for six hundred thousand dollars, but I'm assuming it's a lot. <laughs> and so, for this amount of money, I expected to drive the boat as well and just <laughs> everything. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, the, just slap, slap GPU on this IMU and it's fine. Yeah, yeah, they'll figure it out. Well, I mean, that's like, I feel like IMU is like the, maybe, I don't know, maybe it's not the only way to do it. Like, I think there are these crazy sonar arrays too. Somebody was telling me about like sonar arrays that like use so much power that like whales will beach themselves to get away from the sound that they use oh. on like some of the, the military applications. Like, I don't know. Um, like, there's some crazy stuff going on um, yeah. where it's just like, you know, stuff that like I, I've never gotten to work on, like, you know, not working on that kind of tech. But, you know, you hear stories about it and you're like, that is that is wild. Or like mm -hmm. some of the radars they use, like in the in the Navy, where it's like, you know, eight megawatts of power going into the, the radar unit. And it's like the size of a house, you know, and yeah. it's. <laughs> You're like eight megawatts. That's like so much power. I mean, <laughs> like you, yeah. you pretty much need to have a nuclear reactor on board just to power the thing at that point. And so it's kind of, kind of wild. Yeah. So I don't know. I, um, I feel like it's, it's pretty crazy. Like the, some of the tech that, you know, it's almost like you're just throwing money at it <laughs> to get around. You know, and by, I guess, money, I also mean, like, like amounts of electricity or energy or, like, you know, if you just overpower it, you know, you can you can kind of overcome, yeah. you know, technical challenges that way. Yeah, I think that that would be true for lots of applications. Like, if you, it helps if you have an infinite budget as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, one other cool thing that... I would try to go into, but maybe more on a like hobby level would be animatronics. That seems like fun. Uh, yeah, that, that seems like it can be a good side project. Uh, yeah, the, now nowadays you, you see lots of these humanoids, uh, especially from Disney. They are doing quite a bit of research on them. Yeah, Disney's been really interested in that, it seems. Um, I I don't have, like, any crazy inside knowledge, but I do have a friend who's, like, a huge Disney fanboy, and he was telling me that, like, a big reason for that is that, um, you know, a, apparently those suits, like, you know, well, a few reasons. One is, like, the proportions on the cartoons. Like, you can't always capture that with a human in a suit. Yeah. So, you know, if you can have weird stubbly legs and all this other stuff, you can get kind of closer to form. Another reason yeah. is that apparently it's like pretty hellacious in those suits, you know, in the dead of summer where you've got all this material around you and, you know, you're sweating yeah. your balls off or like you have to carry an HVAC unit, you know, with you. 
and that's like another 50 pounds or whatever. So now you're, you know, creating yeah. the need for either like an exoskeleton or I, I don't know how exactly they're fielding these problems right now, but I imagine it just kind of sucks to be in one of these things. <laughs> and so, yeah, I yeah. Imagine. If you can make a robot that looks like Mickey mouse or whatever and, and like walks around and, you know, points at people in a theme park or, you know, whatever. Yeah. like that seems to be the problem with something like that. I feel like from a business perspective is that, you know, how many other people are going to want to buy it besides Disney or how many other companies are going to be interested in it besides Disney? Cause like if they yeah. decide to beat you up on the price or like, you know, bend you over a barrel on the IP, like, you know, who are you going to use as your counter negotiating leverage? And so, I don't know. Maybe that's a little too Machiavellian, but like I feel like that's mm -hmm. that's probably yeah, it's, a pain I, point there. Yeah, it's, yeah. I I don't know how. Do you know how much pepper robot costs? Like this uh, humanoid on wheels from that one. Is that one open source or am I am I mistaken? No, no. Okay. It the. Yeah. I can I can Google it. Pepper, uh, I've definitely seen it before, but I'm I'm blanking and. Yeah, yeah. it's fourteen thousand dollars. How big is approximately. it? Approximately. I think it's like one meter something. I, okay. I I don't know. That's decently decently large. Yeah. And it's got like uh, decent walking capability and. Yeah. Like pretty good dynamics. Huh, that's interesting. But now I'm seeing some piece from from Bloomberg that says SoftBank holds production of one thousand eight hundred dollar pepper humanoid robot. Huh. It's gonna be right. One thousand eight hundred. That seems way too inexpensive for something yeah. like that. I would have it right here <laughs> if it costed that much. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Mm. I'd get two of them. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> What do you think of the uh, the Unitree robot dog? Like, have you seen those things around yet? Yeah, and then there were plenty of them at Icra. Yeah, makes sense. And yeah, um, I think that the small dogs. So I think they sell some um, for about three thousand dollars. Oh wow! Right? Last I checked, it was like that, seven or eight, but maybe that's the. I think that like the lowest model yeah. was something like that. But if not, there's a company called Deep Robotics, I believe. Uh, they're from China. Yeah. And uh, they introduced recently a robot for yeah, uh, 2,800, I think, dollars. Um, also quadruped. Um, That's wild. Yeah. But these small robots, I think these, they are more like toys, really. I, I think the integration is quite limited on them. Like yeah. what you can do with them. Um, it does seem like when you look at like a Boston Dynamics spot, like the autonomy is a lot more robust than something like that. Like I, I've noticed, like I've I've seen a bunch of Unitree robots like running around like a trade event, and like they'll face plant or like smash into <laughs> a wall if someone drives it like full force in that direction. Where like the BDI ones are like a lot better about you know like kind of recovery and, and maintaining their footing and you know they, yeah. it just seems like they've kind of hammered on it more. Mm -hmm. But at that price actually, point, like, can you really be surprised? <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, when I was visiting Icra, they had someone was demoing one of the these quadrupeds, a, a large one, and there was a person standing on top of it. And they could carry the weight. That's why. How big of a person uh, was it? I mean, even a child is impressive, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I don't know, but I can find some pictures. What else did you see at Icra that was neat? Or Icra, sorry. Because um, I didn't make it out. I, I really like that. Sorry? I, said, I didn't make it out. I was kind of sad to miss it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, like on the exhibition floor... I really like the all the haptic interfaces. Uh, there are quite many companies doing kind of like avatar solutions. So you'd have a VR headset, and then you would have the VR controllers, and you could move some robots. Cool. Um, so it's it, it's quite 
quite interesting. Uh, there's of course some delay, uh, and then at times when I was wearing the headset, I couldn't. I didn't have. I had. I felt like I had really weird depth perception. Ah. But that's maybe because uh, you know you see your hands uh, that are actuators, and then uh, you don't know like the size really like how far they are maybe that was it that's interesting um, could it be the focal distance of the cameras too or i'm guessing they mimic human human eye really well yeah not yeah, the focal they, di sorry the the distance between the lenses yeah yeah i feel like that could do it as well yeah um but there were also some these were not really companies like more uh like consortia that were working for i think ANA X Prize, uh, so they're trying to build robot avatars uh, yeah. for some competition, and these had haptic feedback. Huh. So you would have like finger gloves that would provide haptic feedback, and as the robot is touching something or uh, moves the hand, your hand is also being moved because of the feedback. That's pretty cool. How how um, good was it in practice? Because I've like read some white papers about similar tech, but it's a few years old, and it seems like it wasn't great. Like, yeah, I didn't like actually get to ago. test one. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I, I I really wanted to, but I I didn't uh, get to test it. Uh, but it actually made me think of the uh, like imagine the situation where you you have a robot in front of you, so. I usually don't feel any boundaries. So I'd be okay touching the robot or shaking its hands and, and so on. Yeah. Uh, but if there's someone behind the avatar, you're actually now moving his hand. Yeah. And he might actually not appreciate that. <laughs> so, <that's, laughs> so we will need some new social rules about robots, maybe if we do this kind of avatar solutions in the future yeah i feel like because, we could figure that out pretty yeah, quickly that, though because like i don't yeah yeah we could. like if i see like a badger inventory robot like running by in a supermarket like i don't run up and touch it either you know so i don't know yeah i'm like more worried about like getting sued if i break it you know i'm like i don't want to mess around yeah, yeah things covered in cameras <laughs> never get away yeah. with it <laughs> so, cool. yeah that's interesting yeah, I feel like the haptics is, it's so challenging of a problem, but I mean, definitely one worth solving. Like when you're talking about teleoperated dexterity, like being able to fumble around or feel like that's a huge part of like, you know, what makes a technician, you know, skilled at what they do is the ability to, to know by feel like how much to tighten something or, you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. I mean, I mean, also obviously technical knowledge, but you can, have that same brain in a different room if you have the haptics. Yeah. yeah. Um, I also got to test the Da Vinci surgical oh, yeah? system. That was, that was interesting. How was uh, that? Uh, it's, I've never driven one. Yeah, it, it's so intuitive. It, it, I was surprised. Uh, you just put your fingers in the, this uh, yeah, manipulator. And then you have this visor in front of you. So you see the image from the camera. And then you just start moving the hands and the robot reacts. And I didn't see, feel any lag. Uh, like I wasn't focusing on that too much. That's cool. Uh, but during the demo, you could move some rubber, ba rubber bands um, in some environment. And it was. Yeah, you, you could do it straight away. It was so intuitive. And, That's awesome. Um, before, I maybe had some reservations about being operated with one of these, but not anymore. Like, nice. Like, just, just use that. If, if you need to do any surgery on me, I, I trust you. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, it's become so normalized. I mean, those... Yeah. Like, I don't know. Like, I, I heard some stories about, like, the amount of money some of the sales guys that worked for them were making, like, 10 years ago, like, when it first came on the scene. And, like, crazy, like, racehorse money. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I, um, I've um, i been in hospitals, like, in physicians' lounges where there's, like, Da Vinci trainers just hanging out. Like, I don't know. Intuitive did a really good job, like, moving that product, like, into the mainstream. And, I mean, 
it sounds like from your experience, yeah. like it's justified just by like robustness and, and being easy to use. Getting the latency yeah. out of a teleop system too is like one of those things that's like definitely easier said than done. I mean, we've we've got a teleop system in this office um, that you know I worked on, and um, getting the latency down and the reliability up and like you know hardening against you know system crashes was like really 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 difficult and expensive and like. Mm -hmm. just a lot of hours, you know, um, and, and just hammering on it and, you know, figuring out efficiencies and, you know, like reducing the number Mm -hmm. of packets, but not so much that you lose resolution and, you know, like finding bottlenecks, like it, it, it's, it's harder than it sounds to do that. Well, (laughs) I, I think this plays well with my, no, but it's not my rule, but I, I found that in robotics, the 80, 20 rule applies quite well. <laughs> so I bet in 20% time, you got the 80% of the functionality for the system. But then the remaining time, it's just these things that you need to combat to have a solid system that just works. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, this is still very much like a prototype and like, you know, it's, I mean, like to boot it up, you've got to like run four different files and, you know, it's like kind of a pain in that way. But, you know, at the same time, like, I mean, we were able to harden it a lot, like you said, on on the longer tail of that part of development. And so, yeah, Mm -hmm. that's totally true. Cool. So should we uh, should we start to think about folding down just so people still want to listen to this thing? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I could talk for hours, it. but <laughs> yeah. Anything you want to plug on the tail end of the episode? No, not, nothing in particular. Like, let's keep doing robots and let's see what happens. Sweet. Yeah, let's keep building robots. <laughs> yeah. All right, Matt. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. Uh, if you listen this far, thanks for listening. Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you on the next one.